Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 10 where we look at decision making and consumption experiences. So our learning objectives today, explain what we mean by the classic consumer decision model, so it's sort of a hierarchical process from problem recognition, search for evaluation for alternatives, evaluation of alternatives, and decision then purchase, and then a post-purchase evaluation. Moderating effective involvement in this process, which we've covered in uh, the previous lecture, back on learning and memory a few weeks ago, but we'll also look at that as well. How uh, consumers' past experiences drive expectations and judgment criteria, and how this then applies to modelling your own purchase experiences. Okay, let's start with what we mean by a simple uh, or a decision-making process which looks something like this. So this is just a simple way adapted interestingly from uh, library research, so directly applicable to what we've been doing in this subject. So there is some sort of recognition of a problem or that uh, we need something or that uh, it could be something as buying new milk or sugar or buying a new car or going on a holiday. Then there's an information search and evaluation uh, purchase then occurs and then there's an evaluation of that purchase behaviour and we'll go through each of these steps today. Now that's a very simpl simplified model. If we want to think about in terms of what we've been studying in this subject, we've got things like external influences which we've looked at, of which the marketing influence is also something over here. Our outside factors which affected the consumer as a social being how we then work as individuals down here in the psychological field which affects decision making, these two things here. And then we've got our post-purchase evaluation which feeds back into experience and learning. So what is a decision? Well, the decision is defined here, um, the selection of an action from two or more alternatives. Also, a decision includes whether you make the purchase or whether you do not make and or which brand to purchase as well. There's some couple of nice uh, videos you may want to watch, how President Obama makes decisions and how the Andes plane crash survivors made a decision, a very tough decision in order to survive. Both these types of decision making have uh, similarities with what we might do in consumer decision making in that alternatives needed to be evaluated and choices made. So let's start with problem recognition. Now problem recognition is shown in this slide occurs between the tension between two states. Your actual state, not satisfactory, meet the existing needs, and a desired state where something just may trigger the decision process. So we may run out of sugar or milk, and that's our actual state here, and that may trigger uh, the need for a new product or service. Or our desired state, a need for holiday or rest, may trigger problem recognition. And that's really shown on this difference. So it's believed that consumers are motivated, so you can see the importance of motives and needs here, when there is a difference between um, what we call problem recognition above the threshold and uh, no, no recognition. Or, so and this is really the difference between our actual and desired state. So if there isn't a large difference, if we're feeling relaxed or just had a holiday, then we won't necessarily want to go on another holiday. If we have plenty of milk or sugar, then clearly we don't go and uh, that doesn't trigger a decision making process. The text talks about um, problem recognition being a little bit more complex than what I've shown you previously. And you can see here there are a number of types of problem recognition from comparing yourself to an ideal state, so that's like desire. Uh, you may want to uh, not necessarily decide to um, do something about your health or your exercise, that might be denial excuses. Or the problem may not be well defined, for example, financial security. And then there it may also be whether you're deciding to take no action because you just don't have the money or the time or the effort involved. Then if you do take action, then we have what's uh, down here called information search and purchase intention. So this is really a decision tree adapted from previous research from a few years ago showing all the triggers and all the states of consumer decision making. As shown in Table 10.1 of your text, you can see here that um, the time horizon and time limitation also influences uh, our decision making. So for example, sometimes we'll make a decision on an emergency. So this might be that you cut your finger and you need a band-aid. 
you've got a headache and you need a Band-Aid or something, uh, uh, oh, sorry, a Band-Aid, a Panadol. Um, routine, you just need to buy more sugar or milk or breakfast cereal. Evolving, financial security, educational. And then you can see unexpected where we can we need to do some sort of planning. Okay, for, for example, health insurance. Now, decision making, of course, can vary, particularly according to involvement, which is discussed later in the text. And you can see highly involved decisions or new decisions involve what we call extensive problem solving. And this is really where most information search and evaluation occurs. Most of our decision making, about 80% occurs over here, which is routine response behavior. And that's defined, as you can see here, well-established criteria brands, and some purchases are habit-based or based on brand loyalty. Limited problem solving is where we already have some basic evaluation criteria, so buying new clothes, uh, perhaps these days buying a new mobile phone, uh, but you don't have a fully established preference for a set of brands. And so there is still some search involved as well. And of course, as you can imagine, involvement tends to go more towards extensive problem solving. So the next stage in the information search, is, sorry, in, um, in uh, the consumer decision making process is the information search. The first thing is consumers will rely on what they know because there's usually a cost involved in searching time, effort and money. If this is insufficient and it's important enough to the consumers, they will undertake an external search. And there are a number of factors that determine the, the extent of search. Uh, which have been found in previous research and that's shown here so that if you know more about the product that will reduce your search perceived risk actually funnily enough reduces search so you rely on well-known brands um, uh, retailers with established reputations how much time you have clearly more time you have you'll search more ease of obtaining information so um, if we can obtain information quite easily online that will help us search more and the number of likely brand choices. If there are a number of brand choices, we're probably going to search more than if they're less. And here's some of the sort of the major perceived risks which are important because interestingly they limit search. And so you can see here uh, functional risk, you're, you rely on a well-known brand. Physical risk, you rely on safety war uh, warnings, financial risk, uh, you might rely on um, brands that might be cheaper, or you might actually rely on a well-known brand, social risk, similar, and psychological and time risk. Uh, some other factors which increase search shown on this. So if you've got, if you see lots of choices, higher prices, something costs more like housing or buying a car, university education, you're going to search a bit more for it. Situational factors, if you've never bought a house before or car before, you'll, put, you'll search more. If the product is a gift for somebody, uh, Mother's Day is coming up, so I'll be doing a bit more searching than normal. Um, product deviates from the reference group, so if something your reference group is not that familiar with. Personal factors, well, people who are well-educated tend to search more. People who are more open to new information, so they're uh, um, less dogmatic and younger people and that's because the experience isn't quite there for searching so they'll search more. Of course there are a wide variety of, of uh, personal information sources, some of them advertising that we uh, rely on here and they're shown on this slide. The next stage is evaluation and I guess the first thing to ask yourself is what determines the amount of evaluation or effort into considering a choice. And there's three things. If it's a really urgent need, so you have an urgent need uh, to um, deal with a headache or to deal with a child who can't sleep, less evaluation will take place. If it's the product is highly significant to the, to the buyer uh, or involvement, there'll be a greater amount of evaluation. If there are complex alternatives, such as uh, selecting new mobile phones, very alternative plans or complex plans, even by an electricity plan in New South Wales can be quite complex, or determining on a university education, then we are going to see more evaluation. Now, when consumers make decisions, there's two ways they make uh, combine information. As shown in the red slide here, red arrow, they may use what's called a compensatory rule, where it's a summated score. 
sort of what we, like what we looked at with the attitude model. And so poor attributes, so that a car doesn't have very good comfort, may be, um, may be um, I guess, compensated by other factors. The car has good economy, is cheap to fix. A non-compensatory rule means there are key attributes and, there are, and, and usually it's one thing or the other. And this is usually used by consumers to reduce a lot of alternatives down to uh, a small number, which then a compensatory rule, usually one or two, uh, is used, two or three, is used to uh, make a decision. So a non-compensatory rule is shown in figure 10.3 of your text, and it's an ANCAP safety rating for cars, except nothing less, a five-star rating. And so a consumer would use this as a way of eliminating very quickly a number of car brands that are unacceptable because they're not uh, at their level of safety. Now, another way that consumers can evaluate alternatives is to look at brands themselves. So they can look at attributes, which is what we looked at earlier, or they may look at brands in themselves. And so there may be certain brands that consumer will only consider, which we call the evoke set. And of course the criteria which we they use to evaluate the brand. It's also called the consideration set and it's usually a relatively small number of brands. How many? Usually two or three brands we find. The criteria is usually to evaluate brands based on some important attributes and these of course can be our non-compensatory attributes which have been used to construct the evoke set, for example safety. So here's how um, this works. If you are an unknown brand, you're you're just not considered by consumers. If you're known, you're either unacceptable, which we call the inept set, you're, or you could be indifferent, which we call the inert set. And then from the acceptable brands, there may be brands we've purchased in the past and some experienced or non-purchased brands. Now, criteria or reasons for selecting brands can be subjective or objective. The ANCAP safety rating, which we looked at before, is a is a, is a objective safety rating. Uh, fuel economy per litres is a is a objective. But whether a consumer believes a car is economical or safe or um, is has good handling is very much subjective criteria. If the product or service is highly important to us, then we're going to use more evaluative criteria for that. Even where a product or service is particularly important, high involvement, usually the number is six or fewer evaluative criteria. So if you think about something like economy, economy could include fuel economy, it could include cost of repairs, it could even include reliability. Now evaluative criteria can be based on a whim that you just like the product, it appeals to you. It can be driven by an attitude uh, approach uh, a cognitive approach, which we call a summary impression. So I like Japanese cars, German cars are well designed. Or it could be based on attribute evaluation. So for example, safety that we looked at earlier, or a combination of all three. Here's an example of an advertisement showing choice criteria, which are really based on attributes down here. And you can see here, um, buying shoes for young children, usually parents are quite involved, so you've got things like weight, comfort, quality, um, and so some of these are objective and subjective criteria. Here's some other research um, done by myself and a few colleagues from Macquarie University a few years ago, and this looks at uh, reasons for switching mobile providers in 2011. And as you can see, there are different evaluative criteria across different age groups. While it overall it appears poor network coverage is important, as you get older, uh, customer service becomes more important. For the younger groups, customer service, that is less than 34, customer service is less important. It's all about just network coveraging and wanting a new handset. So different parts of the market will use different evaluative criteria. Also different products will have different evaluative criteria and, and here are some of the examples. So it's not always price as you can see, frozen dinner, taste, size, preparation, watches, size, water resistance, alarms, the type of wristband, personal computers and so on. Now the next stage then is, to act is the actual decision. 
And of course, there actually are a number of things that, uh, that form part of the decision. What to purchase, a model, brand, or provider. Where to purchase, a retailer, or type of retailer, or online. The method of purchase, credit, um, buying online, um, lay buys are even used these days, or in some stores, cash. The timing of the purchase, when do you buy this product? Do you buy, and usually most dis uh, important consumer decisions are made around about Christmas time. Why? Because that's when a lot of gift, gift giving occurs, and it's where a lot of uh, people have time to evaluate alternatives. Getting back to our mobile phone example from the same research, here are some um, examples of consumer decision making regarding mobile phones. And you can see that people tend to buy phones with contracts with major providers. Uh, most buy their phone from a local, a local communications carrier store, not online, only a small amount will buy their on, online. Uh, when they buy, will provide in less than a week. And how often, people, about 16% of all consumers uh, according to this research had switched in the last 12 months. So these are all aspects of purchase decision making. There is also the decision to do nothing. Consumer may find it all too hard and may defer the decision or decide not to act. Um, it may also vary according to service and culture. So waiting in line, whether people would wait in line in New Zealand was confidence that their, that their problem would be resolved, whereas in China it was the time and effort involved. If they didn't think the time of effort was, was worthwhile, they wouldn't stay in line. Providing people with too much information, as we saw in um, the lecture, I think it was lecture seven, where we talked about perception, uh, if people are overloaded, then actually they won't actually make a decision, it becomes too hard for them. Here's a good example of the difficulty of making a decision, and that's in switching uh, mobile phone or cell phone providers. I'm back now to switching mobile phone carriers, and a report today shows that while most of us think about it, few actually do, despite the potential to save hundreds of dollars a year. Have you ever thought about switching? No. Why not? I'm happy. When it comes to switching mobile phone companies... I thought about it when I got this phone, but I just chose to give me a good deal and then they've given me like six months free credit. We're suddenly all hung up. Ever thought about switching? Yeah. But never done it. No. But surprise, surprise, new research confirms switches are savers. 26 bucks a month on average. Well, you can save around $300 a year and it's easy. It takes five minutes. People don't switch for various reasons. Dr. Stephen de Alessandro from Macquarie University today unveiled a landmark 40 page report into the mobile carrier switching habits of 1,600 ordinary Aussies. Despite well documented dissatisfaction, just 16% have swapped or shifted in the last year. Most consumers said it's easier to change insurance, to change your electricity, change your water. The only thing that's harder than switching mobile phone providers is changing your mortgage. Well, Gen X said they were on contracts with no escape. Gen Y said it was all too much trouble. Baby boomers said they couldn't compare, while seniors said they couldn't comprehend. Most of us couldn't be bothered picking up the phone or walking into a store and saying, can I get a better deal? Gadget guru Trevor Long. It's almost impossible to compare plans side by side, carrier to carrier, and that's the biggest problem for the average Joe out there. You're so used to being misled and, and treated poorly that you know, kind of give up and you end up in inertia. Rolf Hansen is from Amazon, the latest in a long line of smaller independent telcos trying to tackle the big three by doing something different. It part paid for today's research to try and find out why we're so stuck on our phones and our phone companies. Well, a year ago when we launched, our promise was save up to 50% on your mobile plan, and we stick to that promise today. With the Mason, pay $39.90 a month for unlimited talk and text, plus 4 gig of data for browsing on the net. There are no contracts, but it's BYO handset. Telstra's best deal today was Freedom Connect. For $59 a month, you get $550 worth of calls, unlimited text, and one and a half gigs to browse. You also get an HTC handset if you sign for two years. Over at Optus, $59 a month gets you $750 worth of calls, unlimited SMS, and two gigs to browse. You also get a handset if you sign on, including the new iPhone 4S. 
Vodafone's best deal today costs $29 a month. It includes $180 worth of calls, 200 megs of data a month, and an HTC handset if you sign for two years. You can compare your insurance premiums, you can compare your broadband packages online, try doing that with mobile phone packages. Very, very hard. Better the devil you know. Exactly. And we actually had one consumer said that. It seems like a challenge. So you don't want to lose your phone number, you don't want to lose your service. But in reality, you can pick up the phone and you can change carriers in five minutes. But for almost all of us, switching will mean saving. Those who've been there and done that just this year, now gearing up for a big fat Christmas turkey with all the tree. This is the time to think about the fact that you can have an extra 100 or 200 dollars in your kicker if you just change your plans ready for next Christmas. Okay, as you can see there, the difficulties in comparing quite complex plans and some of the barriers that people had to switching mobile phones. So, um, people don't always make decisions even though they may know that there are that they need to make a change because they're getting poor service. What are some of the implications then? Firstly, the, the first thing is for, the, for people to work out is what is the consideration step and where are, what are the brands that people are choosing from and on what basis occurs. Now this is a way of identifying key criteria. Try and identify the evaluative criteria. Now remember there are six or fewer. Which of these are then used by different consumer groups is an important issue as well. Um, other alternatives and how consumers judge other alternatives is important. What are the cues, brand name, price, Q stands for country of origin usage that people are using as a heuristic or a shortcut in, in evaluation. The characteristics of the cues may be also altered. As we saw previously, network coverage might be an issue too, but it might be less of an issue if you're in a um, in a place like Perth or Melbourne, which is relatively flat, than Sydney or in regional areas which have, which have more coverage issues. So markers need to think very carefully about the, the characteristics of the queues and how consumers use them to evaluate products and services. Um, providing additional information or the value of different attributes is also important. So the ANCAP safety rating is an example in recent times, which is an additional rating which is used by people in, in uh, um, selecting automobiles. Sources of influence or where we get information from, some of the, the pro process that have been used, warranty cards, where did, what sources did you, uh, did you consult in buying this mobile phone or purchasing this car or coming to this university. Uh, in depth or qualitative research becomes a very important part of this focus group research. Um, the, the influence, we can do that by tracking studies, what advertisements people do. We know something about the general use of information by different age groups and social class that we've looked at earlier and psychographics and lifestyle. Also then you want to decide whether these sources are, are actually important, contributing or ineffective. The most important uh, sources we find, interestingly, um, tend to be word of mouth as expected, but when we look at things like consumer durables or automobiles, it's the salesperson. So that is often seen as a very important source of information. Now the next stage, one, which once we uh, acquire the product or service, is its use. And there are three possible outcomes that can occur out of this, depending on whether the, the service or the product meets our prior expectations and we'll talk about what that is in the next few slides and whether the perceptions of the of the product also meets the expectations. If it exceeds expectations we have what's called satisfaction or actually what's called in the book delight. If it meets the expectation it's a neutral feeling of okay satisfaction and dissatisfaction. Now the important aspect here is not only how it performed but what level of expectations. If I'm buying a hamburger at McDonald's, my expectations are somewhat lower than if I went uh, to the Ritz Hotel in Paris, where my expectations and therefore the performance of that service would be higher. And this is just shown uh, some of the types of expectations that consumers use. So it's the, the first one I talked about here, as you can see that I'm pointing at, is the expected performance. 
We could also say what it should be, ought to be. What is the level of university service that it ought to be? What is the level of, of service that a mobile phone provider ought to provide us? And we call this an equitable or a, a fairness approach. And then we have what's called the ideal performance, the perfect holiday, the perfect cruise. Ideally, I would expect this. And so people, consumers have been known to use different types of um, expectations in different types of situations. Here's an example of a post-purchase evaluation with mobile phones, which has to do with getting a higher than expected mobile phone bill. Welcome back. Great to have you with us in the consumer world right now. It is all about switching. If you don't like your deal, move on. Tonight, Chris Urquhart's done the homework on mobile phone carriers. Mobile phone plans. Simply daunting to switch. Are you getting what you pay for? Well, for me, it's very confusing. Are you paying more than you need? I don't think we use all of it. Is it tough to switch telcos? It's very easy to switch a carrier. You have all these these people who are unhappy, but yet they don't change. If you think you're paying too much for mobile phone calls, you're right. And now there's proof. It's very, very tough, tough going. And one of the major reasons for that is because there is no unit pricing in the industry. Dr. David Gray is from Macquarie University and spent months tracking the state of the industry. He's found two thirds of us don't use the value included in our cap. Bill Shop costs us $80 a year each. Gen Y are the most likely to overspend and seniors are the least likely to switch carriers. In fact, very few of us are willing to hang up on phone plans that cost too much. When you have uh, over 40% of the population who have seriously thought about switching but didn't actually, they're actually missing out on a lot of potential savings. Hello. So why don't people pull the pin? We visited this group of over 55s to muse on mobiles. I think it's a plan to confuse people. Simple as that. According to our new group of friends, it's just too complicated to change. So I'll just top it up and continue on. I just figure I'll stay with what I know. I'm perfectly happy where I am. And I can really see no reason to change. Refusing to change could be costing more in the long term, especially if you only use a fraction of the plan. We think mobile of the future will really give power back to the consumer, give them freedom, flexibility and bring some money back into their pockets. Rob Hansen is from Amazim, the carrier which commissioned the research. He says there are cheaper options. For seniors and others that want to control their prepaid spend, Amazim charges 15 cents a minute for calls, 12 cents for SMS and data for 5 cents a megabyte. By comparison, on Telstra's Simplicity Mobile, it's 15 cents a minute for calls, 12 cents for SMS and data for 10 cents a megabyte. And you're not locked in on either. We reckon uh, people here in Australia can cut their phone bill in half, so up to 50% savings. That's really what we experience with a lot of the feedback we get from our customers. Many of us who spend a bit more and don't want a bill shock go for cap plans. For the prepaid and for these, you need to bring your own phone. If you want a cap, a Maysims is $39.90 a month for unlimited calls and SMS with 4 gigabytes to use on data and there's no lock-in contract. Telstra's Freedom is more expensive at $49 a month. It includes $550 of calls, unlimited SMS and 2 gigs of data, but you're locked in for 12 months. For $34 on Optus BYO, which is less than a Maysim, you get $550 worth of calls and SMS and 1.5 gigs of data, but again, you're locked in for 12 months. And on Vodafone's $30 prepaid cap, you get $450 of credit, unlimited texts and 500 megs of data. No contract, but you have to use it within 30 days. If you decide you do want to switch to prepaid or one of those caps, provided that you're not already on a contract, it's not hard to change. That's according to ACA's technology expert, Trevor Long. It's very easy to switch your carry. If you're off a contract, you can switch carry in five minutes. You can go to a service station and buy a card, or you can walk into a telco store, and you can literally walk out on a new carrier with the same phone number. Trevor agrees that being stuck in our ways is just like we're pouring money down the drain. I think the older generation of Ulmer here because you feel like you're getting a good deal and you feel like it's too complicated to move. The, the fact is it's very easy to move and there are a lot better deals out there for everyone. And for more information on those phone deals you can go to our website. Okay, as you can see there, uh, bill shock is a major issue uh, and the complexity of, of contracts makes it difficult for people to swap. And people have used caps to try and, uh, I guess, 
um, not have this bad post-purchase evaluation, but of course they may be spending too much money on their mobile phones. So there's never a perfect solution in um, decision making. Okay, um, sometimes when people make uh, unwise choices, while we might expect people to be dissatisfied or even to switch providers, often what people will do, particularly if the choice is expensive and they're locked in, is that they actually may engage what's called cognitive dissonance. And this is really about protecting people's beliefs or century hold beliefs that they haven't wasted their time or money. And so there are four outcomes that people may do. Firstly, they may rationalise the decision as being wise. Yes, I paid more for Telstra, but it has a better um, network coverage. They may look for advertising or information that supports their choice. Interestingly, they may persuade friends and family to buy the same brand, and they may talk to other satisfied owners for reassurance. So importantly for, for marketers and people in consumer behaviour, it's important to recognise that after a big decision, consumers are looking for reasons that they've actually made a correct decision. And if we can provide that information to them and to encourage them to share their, I suppose, their, their experiences, if they're positive with other people, that will then help build brand loyalty. So there's quite a bit, this is really only skeleton lecture here. Uh, there's a number of other factors that, uh, that are discussed quite widely in chapter 10 written by my colleague uh, Hume Windsor. And in that, we, he, we should look at, or we looked at today, the definition of decision. We, we used a simplified model of decision making, but just be aware that uh, Hume has provided some additional notes there about involvement, means ends change, fear of making a decision, and so on, which are towards the end of the chapter. The components of, of the decision, which are problem recognition, information, search, the decision in the decision making model and the role of cognitive dissonance in post purchase evaluation. Hope you found this lecture enjoyable as we did in doing the mobile phone switching research back in 2011 and 2012. Thank you.